Scripture reading this morning is from Genesis 38. Genesis 38, 1 through 6. And it came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adolamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he named him Ur. Then she conceived again and bore a son and named him Onan, and she bore still another son and named him Shelah, and it was at Chesib that she bore him. Now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. The last few months, for those of you that pay any attention to the news, and those that probably don't, know that there's been full of reports about men from Hollywood's elite to politicians to broadcasters to others in power who have abused that power by preying on women and harassing women. And you know, I think the cause of that, the root cause is excessive power that they think they have and makes them think they're invincible and can do whatever they want. It is an excess pride that is often condemned in the scriptures. And to a lesser extent, often in the realm of Christianity, people do the same thing or fall prey to the same thing. They become lifted up to the point where they think their ideas and their reasoning succeeds, supersedes God's word. And we're going to get back to that later on. But I think it's interesting that uh, men who are called to scripturally to be the leaders are the ones who normally get all the attention. You know, with the attention of Mary and maybe Elizabeth, uh, men dominate the story of the birth of Jesus. You have the shepherd, you have the innkeeper, you have Joseph, you have Herod, you have wise men uh, coming later. But hidden in the genealogy of Jesus itself is something that is different because in Jewish genealogies they never listed the women because they were basically non-decision makers or non uh, had a non-legal status as far as as far as the genealogies were concerned and the law. Uh, they were tied to their husband usually. And because it's unusual to find this, the women listed in Jewish genealogies that you find in Matthew, the first chapter, for example, uh, it's kind of interesting that all of a sudden when you read Jesus' genealogy in Matthew, the first chapter, what you're going to find is there are five women that are listed in his genealogy, which is rare for any genealogy of that time. And uh, what is almost scandalous is that three of the women didn't even come from the family of Israel. They were not Israelites. They were not Jews. Uh, until they married into it. And even more scandalous is three of these people were guilty of immorality. And you would think, why would Jesus allow such wicked women, I put quote around the wicked, to be included in his son's background, his genealogy? Shouldn't Jesus have been pure Jew? And Jewish people, descendants from the, the sons of Abraham down? Shouldn't all of the people been there? You might think that, but you don't find that, in fact, in history. I wonder sometimes why these women were included and others weren't. But I want us this Christmas season, instead of concentrating all the men, I want us to concentrate on the women that were involved in Jesus' background who they were, and what they were like. Uh, and so we're going to start this morning with just one because of time. Uh, 
And that's Tamar, who's mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1, 3, and she's also mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus in Ruth 4, verse 12. And we need to start, I think, by looking a little bit at the background of what's going on here. And this is the interesting thing about, about this, uh, to me. You find this record, and you might want to put your finger there and look at it as we follow along as I tell the story later. The story there in Genesis 38. But what's amazing is before that, you have the story of Joseph being sold into slavery. That's chapter 20, or 37. And in chapter 39, you go right back to the story of Joseph. This is kind of shoehorned in between, which is interesting. Joseph has been visiting his brothers. Uh, you remember they all wanted to kill him, but Reuben. And Reuben talks him into putting him into a pit for later. He planned on coming back and rescuing him and sending him home. But Judah talks his brothers instead of killing him to selling him into slavery in Egypt. You know, it's, it's better to get some money from your brother rather than just to kill him. You know, and send him to Egypt, we'll never see him again. Uh, but this must have created some problems because in the scripture reading, we find that Judah, who's the one that recommended selling him, leaving his brothers and striking out on his own. Apparently there was some type of uh, uneasiness. Maybe Judah was feeling guilty and didn't want to face his brothers. We don't know what it is, but we find him striking out his own. And then Judah did something that he shouldn't have done. He married a Canaanite. His da her dad's name was Shua, but nowhere in the Bible do you find out who the lady was that Judah married. We're not told. We don't know her name because those names aren't important. She bore him three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shia. Shia. Well. <laughs> and then, as the story goes on there in chapter 38, Judah finds a Canaanite wife for Ur, his eldest son, and it's Tamar, is her name. But then the story starts to get flaky in some ways. His or son all of a sudden dies. The Bible says God killed him. It's that plain because he was so wicked. And so God took care of that first son. And to understand the next step in the story, you have to understand Jewish law a little bit. Okay? Because what we find next is a lever at marriage. Everybody know what that is? Yeah, okay. Basically, if you look at women in the Jewish society, they were always at risk. Okay? They didn't have legal status. And basically what happened is the inheritance always went to the men. And so if you were a woman and married into a, that society, if you married a Jewish man, okay, unless you had an heir, you, were in prob you had problems. Because until, as long as that husband was a died, he would take care of you. And a lot of them were very good to their wives. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying this is the way our society should be. That's just the way it was. But... If you didn't have a male heir who would inherit from his father, then after your husband died, you were out of luck. There, there was nothing there for you, no way to survive, to make a living, basically. And it was important for them, the Jewish men, to have every son be accounted for uh, in the Jewish laws. Uh, and so the Jews had a law that God gave them. This is God given to help to take care of this problem for the women. Uh, now remember under the law, they were also forbidden from marrying a close relative. You are strictly forbidden from marrying, say, your sister-in-law. Okay? 
That's, that's a no-no, or your brother-in-law. Those were things that were forbidden, or any other close relative, with one exception, and that is the leveret marriage. And that is found in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. This is the one exception. And remember, carrying on the son's name was so very important for them in Jewish records. And there it says, when a brothers live together, and one of them dies and has no son, and the wife of the deceased shall be not shall not be married outside of the family to a strange man. Now notice there is an accept, or a, a requirement put down for a leveret marriage from the very beginning. Some of the leveret marriages you may see on Jewish programs on TV are not true leveret marriages because they don't live in the same household. You remember in the Jewish system, the father had his home, and usually when you got married, you built... <laughs> an additional apartment to the home, and that's where you lived. And they built an additional apartment. It just went down. So they become pretty large home complexes. And so if you lived in that near vicinity to one another, it says uh, this is who this applies to. If you've left the home and are thousands of or hundreds of miles away and don't live near each other, this doesn't apply. Okay? It says then her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as a wife and perform the duties of the husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn who she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother and that his name should not be blotted out from Israel. But if the man does not desire to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go to the gate, to the elders, and say, My husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel. He is not willing to perform the duties of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of the city shall summon him and speak to him. And if he persists and says, I do not desire to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the sight of the elders, pull the sandal off his foot, and spit in his face, and she shall declare, thus is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And in all Israel, his name shall be called the house of him whose sandal is removed. So basically, if a son died, especially the eldest son, his wife would be passed down to the next son. That was the way it worked. Uh, that was the responsibility under the law. And... Uh, to the first child born to that, he would take his, 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 the, the dead son's name, and that would become the way it was recorded in the Jewish law. Basically, so that line would continue on throughout history. See, otherwise, the family line ends, and they don't want that. They want all the son's family line to continue. But if the brother refused, the wife had a claim against him. And this was to protect the wives. Uh, it says she was to take off his sandal. The NSB says spit in his face. But generally, the meaning should be she spits before his face. In other words, uh, usually she spit on the ground in front of him. Uh, there's symbolism there, but I'm not going to share it here. But he then carried on the shame of what he had done, that he had refused to follow the law, that he had refused to uh, do his duty, then that was recorded permanently as a mark against him. And you were kind of uh, askewed by other people in, in Israel if you did such a thing. That's a sh considered a shame because you've broken the law. Now, the application to Tamar's story uh, is very clear. By the way, the only evidence we have in the Bible of the Leverett marriage taking place is with Tamar and with Ruth. Uh, those are the only two we have. And by the way, we're going to be studying Ruth too because she's one of the people that is mentioned in the ge genealogy also. It's interesting that that takes place that way. Uh, 
But Tamar, after her husband died, or died, then she was given to Onan by Judah in marriage, and things didn't get any worse for Tamar. Uh, he didn't want to raise up a child who wouldn't be his own, but would be in his brother's name and legally raised as his brother's heir. He didn't want that. And stop and think about it. If he can get heir or heir's name wiped out of history by not performing his duty, he gets the inheritance of the firstborn. But if he does his duty, then his son would get the inheritance. So he gets a lesser portion of the inheritance. So he had reasons to do what he did. Uh, he rejected, the Bible says, and he misused Tamer. Uh, basically, ba he used Tamer for his own pleasure, but then he practiced a type of birth control so she didn't get pregnant. It's that, it was that simple. He made sure she didn't get pregnant. And, uh, of course, our God, being a God of justice, didn't like that either. She was rejected and abused and twice widowed, and basically God took Onan's life just like he took Ur's life because they were wicked. And this makes Judah real nervous. You know, am I going to give him my third son, my last son to her, and let her kill him too? He was blaming it basically on Tamar. And so he basically said, you go home to your father's house, and when my son is older, then I will give him to you in marriage. Now think about Tamar for just a minute. She was rejected, abused, twice widowed, now pushed out of her family. And I think Tamar, having been in the family long enough, knew probably the scriptures. And what does the scripture say about the tribe of Judah? What is the promise that Mo is made through Moses? That the Messiah is to come through Judah. Tamar is there. There's three sons. Two of them are dead, so that only leaves the other son that the Messiah has to come through. And I'm sure she's thinking out, I could be an ancestor of the Messiah. Maybe generations later, but it may be me. And I have a feeling she wanted to be part of this. But for her, basically, being thrown out of the household, there's no hope of a future. And even survival would get hard in the, diff or in the coming years, depending on her father and her brother's generosity towards her is the only hope she has. So basically, time goes by says it's a pretty long period of time. Time goes by. Judah's wife dies, uh, the daughter of Shua. She dies. And Judah determined that he's going to go up to, uh, to see his sheep shears and see how they're doing. Somebody brings word of this to Tamar, and she sets a trap for Judah. Basically, uh, she changes out of her widow's clothing, puts on a veil, and set on the side of the road where she knew Judah would be passing. She was playing the part of a religious prostitute. And that's what Judah took her for. And Judah isn't acting very spiritually either. He saw this spiritual or this religious prostitute. By the way, did Judaism have religious prostitutes? No, they didn't normally. Judaism didn't. But the nations that there around them did. And so he probably has, wasn't even worshiping Yahweh in that way at the present time because he sees this religious prostitute uh, 
And he asked her, he says, what is the price of coming in to your home or into your room? And she says it would be a kid from your flock. I want a little goat or a little lamb. That's what I want from you. And uh, he says, well, I don't have it right now. And she says, well, then I need a pledge from you. And he gave her, and he says, what do you want? And she says, I want your signet ring. I want the cord around your waist, and I want your staff. Those are the three things I want from you. And, of course, she knew that Judah would be known by those things. So she slept with him. She disappeared from him. He didn't know who she was because she wore a veil. She disappeared with his ring and cord and staff. Three months later, somebody brings news to Judah. He says, Tamar is pregnant. And Judah says, I can get rid of her now. I've banned her. Now I can get rid of her because she's committed adultery before God. And so he says, bring her out. Bring her out and have her, uh, was it stoned or burned? I don't remember which one it was, to death. Have her killed. And of course, then she sins. She used to be burned, I think. Then she uh, identifies the father by showing Judah his ring and his cord and the staff. Whoops. You're caught in your sin. And Judah admits that she is more righteous than he is because he didn't give her his last son, which was the law. So as you get to, I guess we're already there, the rest of the story, basically, uh, he takes her back into the household, but the Bible says he never had relationships with her again. She had twins. And I, I'm never, I've never figured out exactly why it's all recorded the way it is. But the first twin stuck his hand out, and the midwife tied a scarlet thread around him. And then he pulled his hand back in, and the other one twin was born first. Uh, and then the one with the scarlet thread was born later. But the one that was born first was uh, Perez. Uh, and the second one, the one that stuck his hand out first, was Zira. Uh, and Perez became the ancestor of the Messiah. So basically, she did get her, her wish, her dream. Uh, and that genealogy is recorded both in, in Matthew and in Ruth. Now just think about Tamar for a little bit. Desperate situations call for desperate measures. And her future was bleak. And so she did the only thing she could think of doing. Doesn't make it right, but it does make it understandable. Remember, she was pushed into this position by a man or men who misused her. And she's very much like the women of today who are beginning now to come forward and report the abuse and the harassment they've suffered from men on the job. They're coming forward now it just seems like they're crawling out of the woodworks because of the abuse they went through. But they understood they had no power. So there was nothing they could do about it. And that's kind of the position Tamar was in, the same one that you see happening around us today. But I think we should be sure we did not to judge her by our own standards. Because I think God saw what was in her heart, and he honored her faith, and he honored her desire to have a part in the future Messiah. I think he looked, as he always does, inside what's inside our hearts. And he knows, we know, he knows us better than we know ourselves, if you really stop and think about it. And he understood her desire to serve him. Seeing her name on this list of Messiah's ancestors, I think should remind us basically of three things. 
First of all, that God's invitation is open to all. Even in the days when we thought the door was shut to the Gentiles, God still led them in if their hearts were right and if they came in in the right way. God's invitation is open to all men. She was an outsider from the commonwealth of Israel, but God was willing to allow her in and become one of the people in the line of the Messiah. Uh, second of all, I think is in her we see the reward of faith and a desire to serve God. And last of all, it teaches us that cleansing of sin is possible. And, of course, it's more so for us, I think, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I like what one author said in summing up Tamar's life. She said this, He took away her names of abuse and rejected and ignored and deceptive. Did Tamar know that he would take away those names and give her a new name? Did she know he, know, she know he would redeem her story? God did. He did mighty things. He redeemed her in tough times. He changed her name to wise, mother of many, and redeemed.